puts it, my organization knowing, but anyway, um, once the cameras settle down, then we'll run through the positions of the, uh, the cars, and in fact, I'll read them in the front, and uh, we'll start off with the Alan Moffat Vern Schuppen car, the Falcon, which got pole position at 2 minutes 25 seconds, as you've heard already. Uh, that's quite a phenomenal time. The uh, second car up there is the car number five, the Brock Brock car, the Brock brothers. An unusual choice for um, the co-driver in that uh, Philip Brock has got the drive with Peter Brock. Philip Brock's first really big race, and it'll be interesting to see how well he can hold up from that point of view. Following behind those two people is the number one um, Holden dealer team car of Colin Bond and John Harvey. Again, a very good crewing of these two drivers. Their time, 2 minute 26.2, a little bit slower than they expected. I think they uh, thought they'd go for uh, pole position, but they decided against it yesterday. Um, a lot of the blokes that are up in the front did so on what are known as sticky tires. These are tires that are used only for uh, practice periods, can't run these long distance races, but give them very quick times. There was enough money on pole position that it was worth having a go, these sorts of things. Here's Alan Moffat just uh, popping himself in. The earplugs you can see these people uh, wearing is just a matter of keeping the noise and vibration out. Um, fatigue on the driver is a very important thing. The concentration that Peter Brock was talking about before is very important, and he can try and keep a lot of fatigue out by put, putting special seats in there. Uh, Alan Moffat is running his car specially silent so that, again, he can just concentrate totally on that job in hand. The plastic tube that you can see just hanging down from the front of him is connected to a thermos in which he will have his special drink, which he always gets his wife Pauline to prepare for him so that he can have a suck on that uh, tube and get himself some refreshment. And again, the idea is to keep the concentration level as high as possible. The Falcons are not as easy to drive as, as are the Tiranas, and so Moffat's got a harder job than the boys in the other cars. Peter Malloy giving him last-minute instructions. They had a number of problems over the, uh, the night, as Peter was saying earlier on. We'll sort of tell you about those a little bit later on after the race has really started. Before the start of the major race. Well, it really depends on the makeup of the driver himself. The drivers at the back of the grid, for example, would be more concerned at doing the first two or three laps without getting involved in someone else's shunt. But the drivers at the front of the grid, especially people like Moffat, and Moffat, I would say, is under a tremendous amount of strain. As Peter Malloy, his mechanic, has already said, obviously Moffat's been very difficult to work with, which is a sign that he's under a great deal of stress. The thoughts that would be going through his mind at the moment would be primarily to get a good start, the, 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 the token that he made at the moment, he would hardly even be thinking about making, really. It would be just a gesture. His mind would be primarily wanting to get that engine started and wanting to get moving. I really feel that that's what a driver wants to do. It's the sitting on the grid. Really, he knows the car will be basically OK, and really, he just wants to get moving. And this is what the majority of drivers would be feeling like. A complete professional, Alan Moffat, alongside another professional, but I think from the conversations, a little more relaxed, Peter Brock. He's in car five. Cast to watch car nine on the right of your screen, Alan Moffat. Car five, Peter Brock will move up alongside him to share the front row. One tenth of a second slower in practice yesterday. And then the field spreads down. Let me quickly run through the cars behind in grid position, which means that the first car in each row is on the right-hand side of your screen, or the left-hand side of the track, which gives them the inside running in the first corner. Hardy Ferrado corner, or the old hell corner they'll face. A reminder to... Um, Sydney viewers especially, but all those within reach of the Sun Herald, that if you have the Australia's biggest selling Sunday paper with you, you'll find a complete lift-out supplement with the list of starters, information about drivers, and a very easy point to follow. Talking of interesting points, Howard Marsden. Right, uh, you're seeing what is known as an S-car cage going in there. The idea of these things is if the car happens to have a roll or goes into the bank sideways, the forces are such that the driver's arm and head can actually be thrown outside of the car and it can roll over and trap him and cause great deal of damage. Something that was developed in America, they strap those things 
buoyancy and so that the man cannot come out in, in an accident, but they in fact can be pushed back into the car quite easily so that uh, any rescuers uh, can get the man out of the car. It's part of the regulations here that they have to run with the driver's window open so that if there is an accident, they can get the man out without any troubles. And a signal to start is imminent, the release of Goodyear balloons loaded with gas and many of them laden with presents. If you find one of those, you could win a couple of tyres or something. Several hundred of them, in fact, being released here at the circuit. Mechanics now being cleared from the circuit. Nice. Leaving it just to the drivers and their thoughts as Australia's greatest car race is now only a few moments away. I think the point to watch for this particular start, we won't try and talk over the top of it, is the fact that the Tiranas have trouble with their rear axles. If they try to put too much power in too quickly, this could break an axle actually on the start of the race. Expect the Falcons, as you can see them on the front left, right-hand side of your screen, Moffat and Goss, to take the first two positions through Hell Corner. Bush Clearing Car has just gone round to make sure things are safe. A quick run through on the cars facing you on the right hand side and in pole position, Alan Moffat in the Falcon number nine. Alongside him in the blue and white Tirana, Peter Brock on the second row and the, there's a three minute sign going up. With a clear run through the middle is Colin Bond in the Holden dealer team car number one. Bobby Morris alongside him on the far left of your screen in car number seven and he will try to make a quick start because he wants to lead from the beginning. The second of the Falcons on the right hand side, John Goss, car number two. Alongside him, we were to have had the uh, first of the Alan Grice and Frank Gardner Tiranas. They ran two and they qualified the second one and decided to run the second one, which is further back. That's car number 12, be driven by Alan Grice. Alongside him, he has the second of the Holden dealer team cars with Charlie O'Brien and Wayne Negus, their number eight. On the next row, car 15. Peter Jansen, who have Kevin Bartlett with him, and alongside them, Jack Brabham starting for his partner, Sterling Moss. They're only in ninth place on the grid. To go back further then, just very quickly, we have the Cullen Max Stewart, the Warren Cullen Max Stewart car, number six, the uh, Hindoff Wigston car, the duty-free store machine, number four, the great engine tuner, Bruce Hindoff driving, Bob Skelton and Alan Hamilton in car three, Murray Carter, Ray Winter in 18, the third of the Falcons, and car 14, Bob Forbes with Russ McRae in the Andronicus coffee car, way at the back there, but with a time of 2.35.2, still well and truly in the hunt. Car 13, West Australians, Tim Slaco and Brian Rhodes, 2.35.3, there further back, alongside the first of the three-litre cars, Barry Seaton. I'll just run through the drivers now very quickly. Graham Moore is next in car 28. Alan Kant, Lacus Manticus, and then the first of the two-litre cars, we have Ron Dixon in the uh, Ron Hodson car, just in front of Jim Langpeach in the Endrust Triumph Dolomite, the two Dolomites really outpacing the opposition as far as the two-litre cars were concerned. Then we have Nelson, Leeds, Scaife, Williamson, Holland, Angus, Board, Older in the BMW, Wheeler, up goes the one-minute mark, John Leffler in the Alpha 59, back in 32nd grid position, Porter, another Alpha from Victoria, from Clemens Sporting Car Service, Peter Werrett, in the um, GTV Alpha, the left-hand drive form driven last year by Marie Claude Beaumont. Hodson, Arnell, McDonald, Selden, the time is getting very close. Gillard, Jones, Holden, Merkett, Pyre, Nuttall, Granger. We're up to car 46. And then we have 30 seconds to go. Then we have the two girls with um, Christine Gibson and Marie Claude Beaumont back in 48th place. We'll run through the full field and show you classes, of course, when they start. Peter Brock, though, alongside. Let's just watch the start now. Moffat on the right, Brock on the left, Bond between them, and Morris, the one to watch on the outside on the left, will make a fast start. Johnny Goss on the third row. Ten seconds. The Hardy Frodo, 1,000, 163 laps to go. And on the grid, Jack Brabham has been rammed in the tail. The driver of the Dolomite seems to have hurt his neck, 35. And there's a spin there, you can see one of the, one of the Capris facing end on, and he has got it to Mazda right up the nose. Goodness me, all sorts of dramas. The big one, of course, affecting Jack Brabham, but Laurie Nelson got hit head on there. That's the back of Brabham's car. Goodness me. Got slammed in the back there. I just can't believe you can see the, the, the damage there to 24 just being wheeled off the track on the first bend. That's John Duggan in the Bangalore Motors car. 
Meanwhile, back at the race, the leader is Moffat, then it's Bond, then Brock, and I think it's uh, the second of the Holden dealer team cars up there. Just, yes, it is, in fact, Charlie O'Brien in fourth place, just in front of Bob Morris. But Jack Brabham, on the starting line, rammed in the back of the car. Of course, a fact that's not known to the leaders, as it's Moffat. For the first time up the mountain, the first of 163 laps with Colin Bond right on his tail. Yeah, I feel for them just so much. Yeah, physically that. having to manhandle the car off the pit street. There's nothing they can do about it. Jack Brabham is just talking himself out of the uh, the seat. Slammed into by John DeLacker in the dollar mine sprint, ended by B&G Myers Leyland, a very unhappy fellow. He seemed to have some sort of neck trouble. He was quite dazed there. Meantime, back in the race. Charlie O'Brien going through in car number eight from Queensland. He's in fourth place. Bobby Morris right behind, blowing a bit of smoke there. Just a touch. And a bit of a wiggle and a waggle there for Morris in fifth place. The tyres are not yet warm, even under these uh, conditions. They must have a little bit of heat in the tyres before they start to work properly, so they've got to be very careful on this opening lap. Notice through the forest cutting there that the Brock car blew a lot of flame out of its exhaust pipe. Peter Jansen just leading Alan Grice. Running in fifth and sixth place. Then John Goss, next car, Murray Carter, who's moved up in the third and last of the thousands. And the field streaming for the first time down Conrad Strait. Now we'll find out about Colin Bond and his brakes that he's been talking about so much. He's moved to one side. But it's deeper into the corner that Moffat is going. Moffat, going for a later braking mark, you can see the gap itself. And with the wipers on already, a bit of a wave from the car with still cold tyres. And for the first time, it will be Alan Moffat using up all the road. A much tighter line by Colin Bond, and he is going to snatch the lead. Brock made a bad mistake there. Bond, first across. Brock has dropped back. Matley now to retain fourth place, but he's lost it to Bob Morris. And it's Bond through for the second time. O'Brien, then Morris, then Brock back in fifth place. Goss. I just may add, uh, I was speaking to Howard earlier this morning, and I said that the shoulders of the circuit, you'll notice on the screen, the left-hand side of the screen, that glaze, that is a water residue on the circuit, and this is going to cause a lot of drivers a lot of trouble until it dries out and I think Colin Bond's rallying experience is going to hold him in great stead in the opening sessions of this race and it's I can only say for Blue Unions that have sponsored Sterling Moss and Jack Rathom I really feel for them at the moment they must be just so despondent they didn't even get off the line Colin Bond in the lead Jack Rabham rammed on the line by the Triumph 35 of John DeLacker Rabham must have stalled or stopped or something happened the Triumph coming through quickly didn't see him Ram. Bond at the top of the pits, coming into the at the top of the straight, coming into the pits, by the way, is the first car, Honda number 62, calling in there. That's the Mobison Motors entry, Roger Bonham pointing to the front. Colin Bond pointing the car very rapidly round the top of the circuit as he goes flying through uh, Skyline towards Skyline. Colin is definitely hot. This man is going to win the race unless the car absolutely lets him down. He wants this one very badly indeed. He's sort of had to play second string for too long as far as he's concerned with regard to results. And he's driving extremely hard. For a man to be able to run away from Alan Moffat as he is at the moment means that he has got a definite plan to run as hard as possible. We'll put a stopwatch on uh, Colin Bond when he next comes past us just to see how quickly he's driving the car under very slippery conditions. Indeed. He must be pretty confident about tyre wear to be throwing the car around. I don't know how. Yes, tyre wear really won't be a problem, particularly with the, uh, the circuit a bit uh, soft there. Uh, tyre wear is not the problem. It's going to be the brakes, really, that are going to make and break, provided there are no major engine problems. There's the gap as he goes over the hump. Colin Bond leading from Alan Moffat. I'll have to keep stressing it throughout the day. The breaking distance at the end of this straight is really where it's all going to be won or lost. So let's see if Moffat has got the ability to come in under brakes under Colin Bond. Colin Bond did an extraordinary passing manoeuvre here when he came in very tightly. A classic wide line taken by Moffat and Bond nipped inside. Took the lead, out accelerated him up the straight. They passed the forlorn, battered Tirana of Jack Brabham who didn't get a start but rammed in the back at the very start of the race. Colin Bond. Some great races developing a little bit further back. It's Moffat who's through second. They're clearing up a little bit. You can see now Charlie O'Brien just coming behind with a gaggle of Toronto's behind him. He has Bobby Morris and then the, uh, Charlie, then the uh, host of other cars there following through. 
what, we've lost uh, John Goss here. Uh, what is very interesting, John Goss is there, but he's already about 10 seconds down on the other people. Uh, I don't know whether this is by plan or by the fact that the car is not yet fully competitive. Now, actually, Howard, John Goss is not very, very competent in wet weather driving at all. He finds wet weather driving, even though it's not actually wet, it is very greasy, and I think he's finding his car a little bit of a handful. The reason for the fact that Brabham was, uh, was rammed was that the gearbox, which has been causing him trouble, played up on the start, and he couldn't get the car going in gear. And John DeLacca coming through quickly from the back and probably a little confused by the... Uh, spreading traffic, ran straight into the back of the Brabham Tirana before the gearbox problems could be sorted out. And Jack Brabham, making his comeback after six years, has set some sort of record by not moving an inch beyond that which the car was pushed by the car that rammed them from the back. Colin Bond, in the meantime, is flying. Now, the Moffat is not prepared to let him get away too far. He's obviously settled down, got a game, a bit of temperature in those tyres. He's got the feel of the car. He knows what the circuit's doing. He's always very careful on that first lap and uh, he's not going to let that lead car out of his sight. Really nipping through those bends, putting the wheel right on the edge, getting the maximum use of the road he can. In fact, going a little wider at times. Yes. He wants to be careful about dropping that uh, front left-hand tyre too close to the edges. He'll end up with a puncture if he's not terribly careful. He did it a couple of times then. Moffat holding station really has dropped back to no more than maybe just a couple of metres that time. Still well and truly in sight. 163 laps, they've got a long way to go. The race expected to take about seven hours to run. We bring you a live telecast, of course, all day. Bond still is. Let's watch as he goes over the hump. The fastest part of the circuit, around 265 kilometres an hour, over 160 miles an hour. Off it will be starting to settle down a bit now. His uh, team did work all night, and they had a great number of problems. Their problems uh, with the joints, the special joints they have on the front suspension. They had trouble with the gearbox. They had a sump that was leaking. They had problems with the rear axle. They had problems with everything that they touched. And you can see the time there. Well outside the best time they did in practice, but of course now they're running full tanks, and they're running knowing they have to go another 159 laps. And Moffat has uh, closed up. Yes, he has. Uh, Peter Brock is up in uh, third place. Kind of the dry car, the tail you can just see there. Of, uh, Peter Jansen and, uh, has got by uh, Charlie O'Brien, who dropped back from being up in third place. He now is at the tail end of that queue. He's had strike. Either that or Harry Firth has given him signals. Harry is going to run a very... Oh, wow, look at Bongo. Uh, Harry's running a very harsh race on his drivers. He's told them exactly what he wants, and he wants no nonsense, or he'll pull them out of the car. I would say that he's given instructions to his number two car to slow down. And this is the advantage that Harry Firth has got, is having two cars. He can run both the, uh, with the hares and the tortoises. And we're coming up to the first overtaking movement of the day. One of the little Hondas is about to be gobbled up by Colin Bond. Uh, he just swept by with Ken Bryan in the auto village Nara entry of a Honda Civic, one of three cars in the 1.3 litre class. Off had a fairly hard line then. Bryan was doing the right thing, but it just made things a little awkward for the very fast charging Moffat, who is closing. He is certainly holding position. He's gained just a little bit of ground. Bond still nipping the line. Watch as he goes down through the S's. I don't know whether Howard Marsden would agree with me or not, but I feel one of the reasons why the driver in the Triumph Ram Jack Brabham was primarily inexperienced. I think he probably froze at the time and just didn't quite react quick enough. Yes. There's so much noise, there's so much drama, everybody else is moving, uh, you drop the clutch, you almost close your eyes, it's almost as bad as that, and you just let it go, and all of a sudden there's this car in front of you, and it's too late if you move. John DeLacca had the misfortune to put his triumph into the back of Jack Brabham. Of all cars to hit on the grid, that would have been the last one that John, I'm sure, would have chosen. Terrible luck for 2SM, for uh, Blues Union, for Gabriel Zatmari, a checkered flag, who made the whole thing possible and gave the race such phenomenal interest, and they didn't get off the line. Quite incredible. But talking of incredible facts, look how Moffat has closed up. There's um, Christine Gibson bringing the... Uh, Brian Foley Alpha into the pits. They weren't very happy in practice yesterday. In fact, they've got a pass um, car 49 actually being pushed along a bit to get in there. And Moffat, as Colin Bond and he start lapping cars in earnest, is right up now on the tail of the Marlborough Holden dealer team car. 
Moffitt is obviously not prepared to let the Holden dealer car have it its own way. He's going to push this car into trouble if he can, hopefully not pulling the Falcon in at the, the trouble at the same time. I think he's just gone for a passing move. Yes, here he comes. Two fully professional drivers know one another. They know how far they can go and how far they can push one another. There won't be any troubles. They won't touch one another. They'll back off at the last moment when they have to. The trouble is going to be when they start passing these cars because some of these drivers won't be expecting to be lapped quite so quickly and probably won't be expected to be lapped by two cars so close together. Courses where the drivers are getting lapped must use their mirrors and must show courtesy. Find them very, very important that they don't get in the road of these big cars. Once you're committed to a line, especially the way both these drivers are driving at the moment, mate, there's just no way you can get out of it once you're committed. Recapitulate in case you've just joined us. We lost Jack Bradley at the start of the race. His car jammed in the gearbox, couldn't get it moving, and as the field was spreading around him, one of the two litre cars, the Triumph Dollar My Sprinter, John DeLacca, from the BG Myers Leyland, Victorian driver, rammed the car and has put Bradley well and truly out of the race. Down the grid in the meantime, the car is about to be hauled off the circuit. There's another incident involving two of the lesser known drivers just around the bend, which has put both of them into pits and fairly lengthy time, but in the meantime, with the race now about six laps gone, this great scrap, and the scrap is still developing with the old rivals, Colin Bond and Alan Moffat. Nose to tail going down Conrad, and a bit of slip training going to happen for a while, and we'll see um, quite a classic manoeuvre here, I think, as Moffat will try and pass in the braking area. A very good manners shown by that driver in the Fiat then, Howard. He gave his right-hand indicator, and this is what they do at Lamar a great deal. Watch the braking now. This is where, as I said before, they all feel they've got the winning car under the brakes at this particular point. The brakes are now stone cold. They're about to get an enormous amount of temperature into them. It's braking very well indeed, very straight, uh, but to no great advantage. And they go past the pits where Marie Claude Beaumont it was who brought the Alpha in with low oil pressure. Bad luck for the Brian Foley entry. They had trouble all through practice, and they're in the pits as Moffat goes by, back in the lead once again. It's a shame about Marie Claude having coming out, come out all this way. Um, they tried to go for the new Alfetta, but uh, I think they would have been far wiser to have gone for last year's GTV, which is now in the hands of Peter Werrett. They've had just too many development problems. They've had engine problems throughout the uh, period. Um, and uh, obviously they just didn't get uh, everything together again. So really I don't expect to see that car out again today. Moffat in the lead, Bond spearing round behind him, almost taking paint from the fence where he can, enjoying himself down the bottom of the track, the Jack Rabbit car being taken away in the back of the truck, a sad sight, on the top of the circuit, Moffat comes round first with Bond chasing, a stirring sight. Actually, just to give the viewers a bit of inside information, the Moffat the, the Moss Brabham mechanics last night, they've worked three all-nighters on that car. Last night they put in a new gearbox, they put in a brand new engine on Saturday, they put in new axles, and this is what happens to them. And I think that people that are involved in motorsport in a sponsorship fashion have got to realise that this is part of the makeup of the sport, irrespective of how much money they put in, these things do eventually, don't they, know it? One thing that is very interesting from that accident that happened right on front of us is that the whole of the back of the Tirana was very badly damaged, but they are under the regulations allowed to fit safety fuel cells, and that the damage sustained to that fuel cell meant that the petrol didn't come out. We could very well have had a very bad fire there and had even more danger. Yes. The, uh, in fact, work is going to go on the car. They're trying to get the car on the track. Uh, the damage is a little more than cosmetic, but repairable. And the Jack Brabham and the pit crew have taken the car to the back of the circuit in the hope of getting it out in the race again. And you can see it now going in, and you can see the extent of the rear damage. Again, one has to feel very sorry for Sterling Moss. He's Indeed. come out of retirement, and he still doesn't know, and the world still doesn't know just how competitive and how well Sterling Moss can drive a car. I wonder if, in a slight way, Sterling is, is relieved, because if the car gets back on the track, there is absolutely no pressure on him. He's not expected to win. They know that they're in a fall-on position, and he might be able to relax and maybe just enjoy himself, saying, well, it's a drive. Let's hope, anyhow, we certainly will see Sterling Moss in action. He's a real charmer, he's been quite exceptionally cooperative during the days here when people could have expected him to be a little bit touchy, but been uh, a most cooperative and pleasant man. Alan Moffat, still leading. 
Hollenbond still trailing. Slow car still keeping to the left to let them through. And a great battle going on behind. It's Peter Brock who's moved up into third place, just leading Bobby Morris, who's trying to pass on the right. And that car back a little by about 50 metres is a man you should watch, Alan Grice, who will have the highly experienced Frank Gardner with him as co-driver. Moffat has always been traditionally very, very quick through traffic. He's got a great ability to read what the man ahead is going to do, and he's got a strong enough mind that he forces the pace when he has to. He also has the advantage of being first car through. He can, in fact, time his run through the traffic so that it makes it even more difficult for Colin Bond to keep in touch with him. A very hazardous part of the race when the driver's being lapped for the first time because it's a new experience today. They'll loosen up as it goes on. And talking of loosening up, Colin Bond is going very hard. He's got on the inside there. Goodness me, this is a 163 lap race. But the spectators at the top of the circuit are being thrilled to some real sprint tactics here. Bond was trying very hard. Moffat's not going to let him get through. And once again, let's watch him as they go down through the mountain where Bond in particular is dynamic. how the times have dropped down. These two are pushing very hard. Uh, the track is drying out now. You'll notice that the cars are not sliding around anywhere near as much as they were before. And, uh, let's see how far under 2 minutes 30 they really are running. The order, Moffat, who leads from Bond. A gap then back to car 5. If you've got your Sun Herald, you'll have all the starters there, listed drivers and details about the 5, of course, is Peter Brock. Pulling out there a little early for a maneuver, but he thinks he's got the legs and he thinks he's got the better brakes and he's trying again. Doesn't like being behind. There's a slow car in front of them. It'll be interesting. I wonder where the clock saw it before he started the manoeuvre, thinking it might be a, a hindrance from Moffat. Side by side. Let's watch as they go into the braking area. The battle of the brakes. It's Bond who will get the corner. I have to change that position too. He's in the lead. Position, of course, on the last lap is indicated to them every time. The order as they go by, it's Bond, Moffat, Brock. Alan Grace. Then it comes through. We'll just pick them up as they go. We'll hold that ankle. There goes Brock. Then Moffat. Grice will come soon. Oh, it's uh, the uh, Bob Morris cars in fourth position. Alan Grace in fifth. Peter Jansen sixth. And Wayne Negus driving the second Holden Deal team car in seventh position. Brock on that lap, uh, Howard did all two minutes. And he is, in fact, catching the two leading cars. You're right about Wayne Negus. I did originally call it was uh, Charlie O'Brien who was nominated as the main driver, but the co-driver, Wayne Negus, from Western Australia, is, in fact, at the wheel of car eight, doing very well. Up in the uh, top of the circuit, by the way, one car that did stop was car 36, the David Selden Dolomite Sprint, ended by the Orange City Leyland dealers. Not a very happy start for some of these trials. One of them ramming Jack Brabham on the starting line, another stopping on top of the circuit. Viewers may remember when the race first started, there was an accident just on the left-hand corner past the pits. Both those cars that hit each other are now mobile. They're both in the race at the moment. Laurie Nelson was the one that had turned round and got hit in the front uh, in the Capri, and I think that he could well uh, have eating problems later. A tremendous dice developing here, Howard. Car 7, chasing is Bob Morris, and the flame pouring from the exhaust there is from the engine of Peter Brock, last year's winner, in third place, not very far back, but he doesn't want to lose contact with them. And Bob Morris certainly doesn't want to lose contact with Peter Brock. Two of the fastest drivers in Australia. Brock's trying very hard, slight puff of smoke as he's going through on the left-hand corner tyre. The uh, Claude Beaumont, Maria Claude Beaumont, the French woman, and Christine Gibson's car is apparently overheating, Howard, and they're not exactly sure why it's being caused. So I'd say, really, your original statement that they're practically out of the race could well hold a solid foundation. So they, they had trouble uh, on Friday when they first here practicing. They decided to change the cylinder head off the new engine from one of the old engines to try and get more horsepower, and things have just gone worse and worse since then. The leading car there is the Capri of Laurie Nelson, the one that was involved in the accident. Just leading the very distinctively striped car, the one they're going to have to pass to in the moment. That, that red, white, and blue is at the Bertolese wine car with Bruce Hudson from Griffith, one of the Escort Artists 2000, who dominate the under two litre class. 
We'll be running through all the classes for you during the race, but at the moment the challenge for the lead is so enthralling. We'll follow this for a bit longer as we see Peter Brock still just in front of Bob Morris on a lot of traffic behind. A possible retirement, certainly a car that stopped on the circuit. One of the favourite cars for the three-litre class, Lacus Mandicus, car 27. Bad luck for the City Ford entry. He stopped in the V6 Capri. Lacus Mandicus, again, has had a very bad run. On Friday, he blew up his number one engine. So for Saturday, he built an engine overnight out of bits and pieces. He blew that one up yesterday, uh, built the what is then the third engine out of even more bits and pieces for today's race, and I'm afraid the end result you've just mentioned yet. Clemens Sporting Car Service Alfetta, a very pretty car that ran so well at Sandown, has uh, gone down the escape road, a bit like Jack Pratt, not braking fail, it was just the Frank Porter who was driving, uh, missed the braking mark apparently, and decided that discretion was the better part of the safety fence, and he dodged the fence, went down the road, turned around, is still in the race, but lost a little time. Peter Brock's driving very well and very hard, and he has tremendous flow in his style on that car at the moment. I, in fact, he is gaining quite a considerable amount of ground on Bond and Moffat. Oh, a tremendous battle here, the top of the mountain now. Brock in third place, chasing to catch up the leaders. Morris doing everything he can to hold on. Tremendous action here in the Hardy Proto 1000, being brought to you live through the Seven Network and all the action following in this live telecast throughout the day. did, but they take so long to, to assemble, they cool down again, doesn't it? still goes on for third place. Peter Brock just stretched his lid a little bit over Bobby Morris, who was doing desperate things on the corners. Look at the way as they come flying around the top of the mountain. This next bend in particular. Watch Morris. A bit of tail end, a little bit of front end, a bit of everything. He still holds the car, but he desperately wants to get up there and doesn't want to lose contact with these leading cars. The one thing none of them are worried about is tyre wear. The old tyre wear problems at Bathurst have gone. Uh, these cars are handling extremely well, Bobby Morris, in fact, has got his car set up uh, very hard at the back end, a lot of oversteer. He wants the back end of the car to stay level. He doesn't want the car to pick up, because if the second these Tirana start to pick up a, an inside wheel, that's when the torque buyer starts to break axles on them. So you'll notice always and throughout the whole of the day that Bobby Morris's car will be more spectacular than anybody else's. Alan Grice, a spectacular driver, running, I suspect, under fairly strict instructions. Frank Gardner in the pits said he wanted to go there to make sure that he circulated around 2 minutes 30. Nothing faster. Frank is a very wise head and knows that the race is not really won until about midday. Doesn't want Grice going too fast and wants to be sure that he has all the pit orders worked out so that when they do come in, he takes over everything. They're working nicely and uh, masterminding things in the pits is Frank Gardner and driving very much in a restrained fashion for the uh, mercurial Alan Grice is the, uh, the former Baker from up Maitland Way. 
Now, a fully professional driver had two cars, in fact, here to qualify. Chose to run the slower of the two. They had another one, a full racing vehicle. Got a slightly faster time in practice, but decided that this was the car that he and Frank wanted to drive, so the two of them started in this car from the third row of the grid. Alan Grice, something of the bad boy of motor racing, seemed to enjoy the reputation. A real racer, running though in rather subdued form, and I think Howard all the more dangerous to the other drivers because of it. That's entirely right. He has got the best co-driver that he could possibly have. It's been a commercial deal. Both of them are sponsored by the uh, Will Cigarette people. So this has put together possibly the wildest man and the smoothest man in motor racing uh, in this country today. And there's the wild man, Alan Grice, at the wheel and driving very smoothly. He now has to pick a line going past the Phil McDonald. Alpha, which did so well at Amaru racing earlier in the year, the two-litre class, one of the older GTBs. Uh, as they came past us on the last lap, that uh, Moffat is getting set up to have another go at Bond to take the lead back again, and that the Brock Morris uh, duo are certainly catching up. So I think very soon in the lead we're going to... Oh, well, Max Stewart's had a lose. In fact, he looks like he's got a left-hand puncture by the looks of it. Fortunately, he may have well have missed that pipe, but no one seems to be running over to him. You can see the tyre marks. He has hit, they missed the, uh, the post, as you can see, which is rather lucky for him in terms of damage to the car, but a real lose there. He's off. What he's done on the other side to provoke, it's a bit hard to see. I can't see him. I was going to say, wheel spin will kill him. He'll yeah. not get out of that without a lot of pushing. He's bogged. This is where he needs Colin Bond for a rally time to get him out there. It's a walking out job. And this is where the, uh, the slick tyres are the worst things you could possibly have. At an angle, he's in a ditch there. He's a bit upset. Actually, Max should get somebody else to drive. He's big enough to push it out on his own. Max Stewart, the Australian driving champion, twice a winner of the Gold Star, Premier Award for the Formula 5000 cars, a very aggressive driver, John Davison. How would he, you're of course one of the top 5000 drivers in Australia in the Southern Comfort Special, the, um, the Manage, but how would you think Max would react to this situation? Would he play it cool or would he be in a desperate hurry to get back on the track? No, oh, I really feel that Max is probably just sitting there at the moment. It's not his car, and he hasn't put any money up for the drive, so I think he'd be endeavouring to play it cool. Besides the fact, what can he really do by jumping around and throwing his hands in the air? Colin Bond a long way back there with... Um, you can see how close Peter Brock has gotten here now. The traffic possibly causing the trouble. Moffat has got away. You can see him disappearing up the straight. Brock is right up close. Bobby Morris is there. He's got the other car in front of him. There's a... a, a the team Dolomite speared over to the right when he suddenly recognised uh, Morris coming through and he'll try and get a toe up the hill if he can. Dixon holding on. Dixon fastest in practice yesterday in the two litre class in the Hodgson Dolomite. Offit is through. By the way, uh, Stewart is out. You can see him now coming in fairly slowly. It'll be interesting it's to find out what's happened, but he is beckoning for these teams to be going to the pits and uh, whether or not Max has had some major troubles with the braking system or transmission that's caused him to have the lose is at this stage we're not able to substantiate. Unfortunately for the people from West Australia, uh, we have the Tim Slaco car now being pushed round to the back of the pits already. I can't tell you what the problem is. We'll try and find out from Kerry Luckins when we can get across, but the first of the Tiranas is in trouble. Murray Carter has called into the pits, by the way, in the third of the Falcons. No great trouble, except the bonnet catches loose and his bonnet is flapping, and they're trying to fix that. Colin Bond going very close to the fence. Point where he rolled once before in the rain, not now, but that early point where he went close to the fence, not worried by it today. He's out to try and haul in Alan Moffat and to keep Peter Brock away. You can see how close Brock is. Now that Brock can see the very curious black and white vertical treatment of the tail of the car in front, he's after it. Bond sliding through, and Brock will come into view, so close is he, as they go down through the S's. And Bobby Morris drop back maybe a little bit, but no further behind than uh, is Brock from uh, Bond, and Bond trying very hard through there. Actually, you know, I'm not an authoritarian on touring cars, but I just can't see a car lasting 163 laps being driven like that. And Bond putting a, one of the Mazdas between himself and Peter Brock. Brock pulls out, though. He can see the Holden dealer team car, the team for which he used to drive, left it. One as a privateer last year, but we need to do it again this year. The latest news on the Jack Brabham Sterling Moss car is that the damage included a leaking fuel tank and broken rear suspension. They are going to repair it. They consider it will take them approximately an hour and they will come out again. So I think we will see both of these drivers out, which is great. Obviously not in contention. 
those of you who've joined the telecast late, Jack Brabham, who had gearbox trouble on the starting line, was rammed in the back of the car without moving. The uh, Dolomite sprinter, John DeLacker, came through the field and clouded the Stacey Brabham. Did severe damage to the back as Card Mars was explaining the bad work on the car. But on the first corner, the corner we've just passed, we also saw John Duggan in the Mazda collect the um, Laurie Nelson Capri head on. Not a great deal of damage to either car, although the Mazda spent longer in the pits. Both are now racing. Once again, Colin Bond trying to haul back Moffat, and maybe even more important, trying to keep Peter Brock away. Max Stewart, by the way, we saw him out in the track. He's now in the pits. Kerry Luckins is there with him to tell us the story. Max Stewart, uh, you have had a fairly early uh, call at the pits. You had a bit of a lose. Can you tell us what's happened? Yes, Terry. I came down the pits as normal and went for the brakes, and uh, the left-hand side front brake hose has burst, and uh, there was nothing there, so we just had to go to Baffers backwards. You haven't damaged the car at all? No, I don't think so. It, um, I spun it out down there on the um, on the handbrake, got it all backwards, and there was a bit of a deep water wash gully. Uh, it went through. It went through that backwards, but I don't think it's done any damage. Fair enough. You got down in Jack Brabham territory yesterday. Yeah, that's right. Same place. <laughs> okay. We well, hope we're back in the race very soon, Max. Thanks, Terry. Well, the same sort of thing, not the same course. The same sort of incident that occurred with Jack Brabham yesterday, at 160 miles an hour. Mm. Max Stewart, Formula 5000 driver, seems quite happy. Maybe to have survived as much as anything else. In the meantime, Brock right up now as Bond can't get by the Capri, and that's all that Brock needs. He's closed right up now. Morris is dropping back a bit, and we have Brock now right up on the tail of Bond. I think really some of Peter Brock's European experience is holding him in good stead. I, look, although he's had a lot of trouble mileage over there, I think that it's given him a great deal of confidence in his surroundings. I think this has made him a, a more polished driver than he was, even though he has been very good in the past. I think he's even better. It's a matter of confidence. I don't know that he's a better driver. He's a more confident driver. He can relax. He can think more than uh, he could in the past. In the past, he's possibly been in a situation where he's had to steer and think only about what's immediately around him. Now he can plan that race from the driver's seat, which is a very difficult thing to do. News for our West Australian viewers is the Tim Slago car, third in the winning of the pits, um, had uh, give off trouble, and they're going to replace the give -offs. of burning a car off, but he almost got scorched then as Colin Bond got right behind the, one of the rotary masses, which gave a typical flame out. Bond is just not getting the brakes. Moffat's obviously getting the clear brakes through the traffic, and Bond keeps getting hit at the corners. That slowing down of that corner will pull him down about three or four hundred revs all the way up that chute. Gives Moffat an extra tenth of a second here and there, and this is where this gap is widening. Actually, one driver that we haven't mentioned who is a long, long way behind Howard, and that's John Goss. Absolutely no sign of him whatsoever. In fact, my last reading, he was about 25 seconds behind Moffat, and that would have nearly stretched to, I'd say, close to a minute now. I think Goss is now um, content to run his race um, as a long-distance race, hoping that all four of these front runners are going to break. He's no longer competitive, obviously, and he's thinking along those lines. Look at the way that Brock just dropped that right left rear wheel into the dirt. That's a problem. They mustn't do that sort of thing. You'll notice also, when you have a look under the back of the Brock car, the very low-slung petrol tank. The idea, again, is to keep the weight down on the back of the car, to keep the roll out of it and protect those axles I was telling you about. Now, that's fine until Brock makes a mistake and drops two wheels into the dirt, and all of a sudden, the two-inch clearance between the ground and that fuel tank has become a very dangerous item. Clip the edge there. Picking up a uh, cardboard box. Luckily, it wasn't anything more solid then, but they are really playing desperate in this battle in the very early stages of this 163 lap race. Brock chasing Bond. This is the battle for second place. Alan Moffat's in front, an enormous leap of flame then. Tell me, Howard, what do you think causes that sheet of flame? I think it's a, a cam timing problem. Not a problem as such, but he's got the cam timing such that he's getting a lot of overlap off the camshaft and that the valves are not closing properly. There's still an awful lot of unburned fuel coming down the pipe. So that the valves don't close on time, his unburnt fuel comes out and comes out as a flame. Very short pipe on those things, so there's no uh, ability for the flame to be arrested before that. Brock is making his move. Can be hazardous with that car to be passed. A real squeeze there, but they get through safely. The driver of the slower car saw them. Bobby Morris took his opportunity to close up. There's almost the 1300 on the outside, seeing all the action in close hand. Almost saw the boot of Bob Morris's car. 
Bond is through first. I don't think you'll ever see uh, Peter Brock trying to overtake on that particular braking corner. As he comes in, he does not hit the brakes, he squeezes them gently. And uh, Colin Bond is in the other situation. They've got a very special uh, brake system, and Brock's gone through now. And it'll be interesting now to see Bond chasing to see if he can keep up and see whether Brock is prepared to push hard to catch up with Moffat. And Bob Morris right up there in fourth place. So Brock now moves to the second, Alan Moffat's in front. Colin Bond is third, but very close, as is Bobby Morris in car seven. Actually, I'd say Alan Grice is probably driving very strictly to instructions. So is the second Holden dealer team car, but very, very close behind the second Holden dealer team car is the Peter Jansen for the Bartlett car. So I'd say that those three drivers, or those three particular cars, are driving a more sedate race in so far as they're probably relying on rely unreliability of the leading contenders to give them the major contention later on. The Bobby Skelton car number three, which Bob has been a, a place getter here, about to be lapped fairly early in the race. There's Peter Brock now just going past Skelton. During the day, by the way, we'll be talking to various guest commentators here, two who we were talking to fairly closely, I mean from the rally world, although one, Timo Mackinnon from Finland, raced here with some distinction some years ago and set some sort of a lap record. The lap record being that he rolled over going down through the S's, got the car back on his wheels, and was only 19 seconds slower than his previous fastest lap, which must be some sort of record for something or other. Timo Magnan, along with his English colleague, Roger Clark, will be driving for the Ford Motor Company in two Works Escort RS1800 models in next Saturday's Total Southern Cross Rally. talking by the way with Jack Bratton in a while from the pits but uh, let me while we watch this race introduce to you the, the great Finnish rally driver one of the truly great drivers of the world as is his colleague Roger Clark who will be speaking in just a little while Timo Mackler. Timo as we watch these cars going down the track that's been resurfaced since you were here you must be struck by the great difference that's occurred in this race when you drove for the BMC team it was when minis were winning now they're wouldn't be quite fast enough no, and I'm very, very happy to see the uh, regulations are more open, it's more noise and much, much faster cars, and I think it's much better for spectators. You'd like to be driving out there yourself? Of course. Well, a Ford's leading. You, of course, and Roger are now driving Ford with Escorts, the uh, smaller car, much more suited to rallying. But these Tiranas, and in fact, the sort of car that's developed in Australia is quite different to anything we had here when you were last in Australia. How much of the circuit do you remember? Do you remember? Uh, I'd remember that very, very well. And um, it's a very, very nice circuit. It's very twisting parts, and, but very, very hard for braking. Right. Let's watch one of the cars go round, and we'll um, have Timo Mackin talk with us and describe what it's like driving around the circuit. Peter Brock is just sweeping through in car five. We might follow him. Uh, you haven't met Peter, I don't think. He wasn't racing, of course, when you were here back in the late 60s. But now you're going towards the cutting. How do you like driving through here, Tim? Remember that fast sweep and then a very tight left yes, hander? Yes, uh, pen what are very much tightening in end. And uh, of course, if you don't know the circuit, it's very, very difficult for one of us. After a few laps when you are doing the racing, you see uh, better drivers are taking right line and you learn the lines very easily after that. Which why the long distance races are quite good for young drivers because those can see better drivers long time and many laps and find right lines. Now, Peter Brock is about to go through the S's. How did you like this part of the circuit? I know you rolled over there, but it wasn't your fault. You were provoked. But going down. <laughs> uh, of course, that was the uh, Cooper Minis, what he was driving, and uh, that downhill bit suit better for smaller cars, of course. And but it's a very difficult place for overtake anybody. But uh, for that time, the Mini, that was the uh, best place for the Mini. Yes. Timo Macklin, what happened to you the year you rolled the car on its side? What caused it? It was the last bend before this uh, long street. Last bend from the SSO downhill pit. And uh, somebody in front of me, uh, when I was coming inside of him, from right in front of me, uh, I have to turn more left and I, my left front wheel hit a bank and I just turn over in the side and I jump off out of the car, I lift it back in the wheels and 
and Andrew Street, I, I passed that same bloke. <laughs> One of the great advantages of driving a light car is you can lift it back on his wheels. Timo Magnan, you see Timo, he's rather big and the sort of man who can do it. Action following in the Hardy Friday 1000, brought to you live from Bathurst as a presentation of Network 7 Sport. Colin Bond. Okay. Very early though, right? third with Bob Morris very close behind him. Holland Bond driving for the Marlborough Holden dealer team. He's had a cracking pace early on. Finally gave way to Alan Moffat and then succumbed to a challenge from Peter Brock but still very closely placed up there. Looks across at his pits to get the signals from Harry Firth. He has Brock inside. He'd be quite happy with that. A few seconds on the track at the moment aren't going to matter greatly because those seconds will be one or lost in the pits as long as he got him closely in sight. Alan Moffat's actually pulling away at about half a second a lap. It's now up to about ten and a half to eleven seconds of even here. So he's obviously prepared to push a little bit harder. I wonder how far Colin Bond can let Alan Moffat get in front. In fact, you've probably wondered what sort of man Colin Bond is. We can follow his car around and by the miracle of modern electronics we can talk to him at the same time. the Holden dealer team, Tirana. That's all. National Touring Car Champion. It's going back probably around about 13 years now. And in those days we had a little motor car. It was a Sprite Mark I and we used to compete at club level doing sort of motor carners mainly. Finally, we rallied it a few times, and then we sort of went through various motor cars from Volkswagens to little Mitsubishi's and so on. And, you know, mainly, I think, in the early days, we competed mostly in, uh, say, hill climbs and in uh, particular rallies. And now, over the past few years, we've sort of got more involved with the whole dealer team, and we've actually been with them for six years. Which area do you enjoy most? It's a hard one, actually. I think that uh, I enjoy rallying and I enjoy racing. I, if you had to do one, I suppose you would do motor racing only because it's a little bit more professional, I think, than rallying, particularly in Australia. It's easier. When I say it's easier, normally the race is a lot shorter, and uh, I think if you've got the best car at the time, it's probably easier to win a motor race than is a rally, because I think in rallying there's a lot more going for it in respect. You've got to have a very good car, very good co-driver or navigator, and a good driver. You used to play soccer, and you, do, you were pretty good at it. 
Did you have any other ambitions that haven't been fulfilled because of your success in motor racing? No, not really. I think that um, as a boy, I thought, well, I may as well go and uh, can try and do a professional sport of some description. I thought it was probably going to be easier than working. And in the early days, that's where we played a lot of soccer up until I was around about 18. And then, you know, I thought golf at one stage of the game might be a good idea. But I never really pursued that very much at all. The motor racing came on the scene not long after, so the football stopped, and it's been with us ever since. Now, you've been so successful in recent years that a few people tend to think that you've always had it easy. But in actual fact, the early days were pretty hard for you, weren't they? Well, I think everybody goes through the same thing. Uh, you don't get to the top just by uh, you know, getting into a good motor car and being there. You've got to have a lot of groundwork. And this all stems from the early days when we were running up and down hill climbs or in motor carners and you know, just competing at club levels. In those days, what you're doing is actually learning. And now you're trying to perfect the um, sport. I know you used to have to wait for your paycheck on a Thursday night to go and buy spare parts on Friday to prepare the car for the weekend. Well, that was right. I think that in those days, um, when we had a very limited budget, we were running a Lynx Peugeot, which was an open wheeler. And I think in those days, you're probably being paid something like five pound a week. And I think that uh, in those days, I remember getting some bits and pieces and couldn't afford to buy them until the Friday night. So it was always a last minute rush to get to the circuit. What's a typical week in the life of Colin Bond like now? Oh, I think these days, Evan, it depends. We're racing probably nearly every weekend. So you might say the Monday, the Saturday, Sunday, and probably the Friday are involved. And then we sort of have the rest of the week off. As we watch Colin Bond circulating, we have sitting with us a man who's not circulating and whose prospect of going on the track looks pretty dim. Sterling Moss, what's the situation with uh, the car that was shunted at the start? Well, it's in not in good condition at all. It's unfortunately pushed the whole back forward and so on, but we're now, I said to the mechanics, can they possibly get it right? And they said, they give them two and a half hours or they can. Well, not right, but they can get it sort of run. So they're now changing what, whatever they can at the back, because I think the chassis may be crinkled a bit. They're changing the fuel tank, back suspension, all those sort of things. So hopefully, in two and a half hours, at least we'll be out there, not with any much chance of winning, that's for sure, but to at least go around, because I think that uh, there's so many people here who I hope, came to Jack and myself, or some of them anyway, that I feel we ought to at least go around so they, get to, so they can do it. Talking of doing things, there's Bobby Morris trying to go by uh, Colin Bond. He's got by, too, going a little deeper. Bob Morris, who, of course, came here with the avowed intention of leading. He's now in the third place, so he's certainly among the front runners and driving very hard. And Colin Bond, in the leading Holden dealer team car, is now relegated to fourth place, having led from the start. Sterling Moss, you were watching the start undoubtedly. What went through your mind when you saw what happened? I couldn't believe it. I, I thought that Jack couldn't have been in gear, and I thought, no, that's ridiculous. And then I thought, well, he must have stalled it. Which, of course, in a way, is what happened. It wasn't really just stalled it, but I just couldn't believe it. Because Jack normally, you know, when the others started to creep a little bit, I thought, well, Jack obviously creeps, because he's notoriously quick off the start, and he didn't move. I thought, boy, he's terribly cool, you know. I mean, right, so he's 50 now, but I'm sure he'd still be a bit out of team. And, of course, what had happened, I now find out with Jack, is that uh, he put it into the gear, and, and he realised nothing you can do about it, but it just didn't seem to connect. The car would not move. Oh, oh, there's a desperate manoeuvre there to take place, and you can see the sort of reaction that's going on from uh, Morris, who's not at all happy with the, the lack of cooperation in getting by then. And what is being done to the car in terms of the gearbox then? Uh, well, the gearbox obviously is being changed as well, but we had quite a biff up the back end that Paul Chapman in the trial. I feel very sorry for it. It's nothing to do with him at all. Um, he backed it, uh, hit the back so far hard that, of course, it's pushed the back end in, stowed in the tank, messed up the suspension a bit, so we've got to change all that as well, and hopefully nothing worse than that. So it's a fair amount of work to do, actually. Yeah. What did Jack say when he came in and spoke to you? Jack's not a man of, he's not a man of many words. He just said, I'm sorry, he said, I put it, he said, he said it was just must be jammed in two gears. He said it just would not move. He said he let the clutch in, and the car just, of course, the smoke you may have seen come out, obviously, with the clutch burning, but it was just jammed into something, into first and second together, maybe, but the car just would not move off the start at all. 
do you feel in a way a, a sense of relaxation now that you when you go out in the car and you certainly will you won't be required to win that you can just drive there and almost enjoy yourself oh no no it doesn't work like that it does not work like that because to me a race isn't over till the flag's down and I've, I've done some stupid things in my life and in fact my last accident uh, happened whilst I was a lap down at Goodwood trying to still trying to go as fast as I could I've got the lap record um, of course I haven't got a chance of winning. I mean, it's ridiculous to even think about it, but I've still got one has one's reputation. Evan, and that is the thing that you are striving to, to preserve. And in this case, it, is, it means an awful lot to me. I mean, here I am 15 years later. And uh, I mean, you know, our comeback was rather spoiled in a, in a hell of a hurry, let's face it. I mean, I haven't got done, haven't done an inch, I haven't driven the car yet. And uh, so obviously I, I hope that I'll be able to preserve my reputation. Uh, and at least drive in a satisfactory fashion. What does worry me a bit is, is what condition the car's in. Is it going to be in a condition where one can util you know, utilize it as best as possible? But we'll try. Will Jack take the car at first when he goes out again? I don't know. We haven't decided on that because I said to Jack, if, he, if he'd rather not go, OK, I'll go, you know, I'll drive it and so on. He said, no, he understood the situation, so who'll go first? We haven't decided. It is, it is not now a matter of tactics. It's just a matter of, of principle, really. Dolly Moss, thank you very much for joining us here. Yeah, thank you. What must be a, a tremendous disappointment to you after looking forward, if that's the correct expression for this comeback, it's certainly been something you've been thinking about for a long time and a, almost a tragic situation to have the car rammed on the starting line like that. Yeah, They're going very quickly out there, aren't they, still? One thing I would like to say yeah. first, and that is I, have, I sure can't wait 15 more years. I mean, you know, 63 would be too, too old. 47, I don't think it is, but 63 would be. Yeah, I think this is fantastic. I, I, tremendous race i mean they really are still going at a pretty fair old speed uh, what what i find so appalling which doesn't surprise me quite honestly is is the lack of manners of, of uh, some of the back markers because I, it doesn't really take much off your time if you back off and give a faster car the correct line it stops you both being messed up and i just wish that they'd had a stronger drivers meeting when we could have aired our, aired our feelings about it you know and i feel very sorry for some of the really fast guys because they obviously are being very hampered at times as we follow bob morris and colin bond in this great dice i wonder if you could describe what it's like to drive around the track what they're doing, what sort of gears they might be in, and your own sensations. I, <laughs> yeah, but if I'd known what they were doing, I would have been doing similar times or faster. Um, I only know what I was doing, and I was doing it with, with the old nail, which was the practice car, which was not hopefully as good as our race car. But um, the, uh, the, the staggering thing is, through all these corners that you can see, is you use relatively little braking, you know, but the point is you need them when you need them. and. and uh, you get knock-off, which is something I don't know if people know what, exactly what it is, but when you go around the corny, corner, you've got so much adhesion and so much weight of the car leaning on the suspension that the brake pads get knocked off. In other words, they get knocked off the actual disc. Then when you put your foot down on the brake pedal, uh, it has to line it up onto the disc, and therefore you lose a lot of, of distance on the pedal purely for the push of the fluid through it. And this is what's known as knock-off. And I was speaking to quite a lot of the drivers, and they all were saying to me that across the mountain, across the top, you are inclined to get a knockoff, and therefore quite a lot of them, I think, probably may seem just touching their brakes, just lightly, not to slow up even, but just to know that their, that their pedal is ready for pressure when they need it. You don't need much, but boy, there are certain times when you need to steady you in the, in the dipper, I think it's called, and so on. But um, and there were 32, that's a pretty quick time, you know, with all this traffic on the road. We've got a lot of cars to pass at the moment, now coming up towards Hill Corner, the Hardy Road event. And I see that Morris has sandwiched a nice little escort between to try and slow Bond down a bit. How much does a driver try and do that to? Oh, a lot. I mean, a good driver, and you're talking guys with experience, you do an awful lot. In fact, you will actually slow yourself up. If you're coming into a corner with a slow car ahead of you, you'll slow yourself up so you just chop in front of him before you get to the corner and leave your, the man behind you with him. I mean, there's a real problem. And then you go like hell. I mean, I remember that. The best example I had for myself was in the British Grand Prix driving against Fangio in 55 and I came across a back marker and uh, we were just playing and I managed to leave him to Fangio and then I went and tried everything I could to get away it just didn't work that well but uh, it really does make a big difference uh, tremendously here of course you have many opportunities because there are an awful lot of cars that are slower Dr. Patrick was saying he found the Tiranas, and he will be driving car 7 when uh, Bobby Morris hands over. He found it a little bit awkward to drive. He'd been handling BMWs and other very precise cars, very highly modified cars. And he said that the Tirana tends to take over and you just sort of go with it. What was your reaction to this big five-litre car? I must say, I didn't find that, but, uh, but he's much more used to this type of vehicle. He's used to cars of this type with much more rubber on the ground, which, of course, I'm not. I'm used to half as much. So his remarks would be much more pertinent than mine. But driving the Tirana, I must say, I was very, very happily surprised at how docile it was. 
uh, our edge in the pitley, I don't think he was giving the power. It might have done, but even then, I thought it was very, very docile, very maneuverable and very manipulative. The main thing was just the fact that when you want to uh, go have a little bit more steering, you need to put the foot on the throttle. Uh, that was the biggest thing I found, actually. Just caught a brief glimpse there from Mamelia Sterling of the uh, car number two, the the Falcon of John Gosh, who won here in 1974. It's about half a lap behind. Almost too much, I would think, at this stage, even allowing for a possible loss of time in the pits. He should be a little bit closer than that because it's a pretty fast pace and a lot of cars are in front of him. Do you think they're running maybe a little bit too quickly at this stage of the race? Bearing in mind they've still got 150 laps to go. Yeah, but there's a lot of cars running quickly, aren't there? I mean, some of them are going to go out. Um, Hey, let's put it this way, if this was in, Euro in a European sports car race, I wouldn't think that, that I would have thought that one or two of the fast ones would have got through even with space with the speed. But having driven around this circuit and found it a, a really a very demanding track, and I think quite hard on the car, actually. I think it's a lot more, a lot harder than people might uh, realise. A classic illustration there, by the way, of your point of the problem of passing slower cars. There we have Alan Moffat leading the car, who got his pit signal showing how far in front of the cars he was. Now having to pass this whole range of traffic, and there, an escort pulls right out in front, engrossed in his own personal battle, and didn't see the race leader come out behind him. That is disgraceful, though, really, you know, I think. And the whole reason, I mean, you get your pit people to put your pit people, I did anyway, put my signals out particularly early, so that the people could see it. And then they'd know somebody fast is coming. Now look, he's flashing his lights. He's doing everything he can to get by. In fact, the Mazda almost went up the bank to get out of the way when he suddenly saw him, but obviously he didn't see him. Now he has an escort to get by. He said yeah, he's good, yeah. Alan Moffat, the leader of the race, a tremendous battle going on behind, and of course, much action still lying ahead. More from the Hardy Ferrado in a moment. Snatched the coveted pole position. Alan Moffat still leading the race. The white was on, indicating it is now raining. And that's going to make some headaches in the minds of the uh, drivers and the pit crew. Alan Moffat, I believe, uh, in fact, makes decisions himself as to when he should come into the pits rather than relying on his crew, Howard Marsden. Yes, uh, the lineup are planned before the, uh, the race meeting. He's got uh, everything sort of well organized. The fact that it's now started to rain will mean that he can back off on his tire wear. Um, this helps the calculation, but it's they've got to check on and they've got to organize it's the fuel stops that will uh, make all the difference to this particular race calculating serious dedicated man is alan moffat but have you ever wondered what sort of person the real alan moffat is where he began what first started him in motor racing let alan moffat tell it to you himself what are you thinking about out there on the track i'm thinking uh, how i'm going to bring it home uh, a winner uh, so many people have uh, put such a uh, great deal of effort into uh, getting me to this stage where we're in a position 
to attempt to win and certainly uh, starting from the front uh, makes it easier to win. Uh, I'm, I'm concentrating on just preserving the car, being as light and easy as possible on it. Uh, all our development has been geared to absolutely hammering the car almost to a uh, destruction point. Uh, we've had a tremendous uh, degree of development work with uh, Hardy Ferrodo engineers who uh, have helped us with our brake pads. Uh, they've made leaps and bounds uh, this year uh, with the uh, application of the brake pad uh, material. We've uh, got some pretty unique discs which are really pulling up our uh, Ford dealer team Falcon to a stop at the end of Conrad, but uh, that doesn't do you much good if the, if the lining wears out. And in this respect, we are, uh, we're very confident uh, that our, our linings are fine and it's in no uh, small uh, degree uh, the efforts of the Hardy Ferrodo engineers that have made it possible to put the particular Bathurst uh, lining on our unique backing pads. Um, naturally, the braking always is a, is a worry to a driver on a circuit like this. Did you ever want to be anything else but a racing driver? Well, a uh, millionaire would have uh, helped. Uh, How would you have uh, gained those millions? Well, I, I don't think I would ever have been able to become a millionaire. Perhaps uh, if I'm lucky enough through my racing, I might become a millionaire through my racing. I'm certainly not at the moment, and uh, far from it. But it's uh, been a, a great uh, challenge. Uh, I've been at it now professionally since 1964. Uh, this is my eighth consecutive trip to Bathurst, and uh, one of the greatest uh, thrills in my career to date has been getting pole position here today. Uh, when we consider the uh, effort that it took to rebuild this car and the tremendous uh, spirit and teamwork that uh, my crew have put into it, and uh, let's not forget the financial backing from my sponsors who have made it possible. But uh, winning the race is another thing, and I think if I could win the fourth time here... <laughs> How old are you? Uh, 36. And that wasn't uh, embarrassment, you were just, you'd had to cut up the years, you've got other things on your mind. Yeah. Where were you born? A um, little place, well not so little, uh, called uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I spent my early years uh, with my parents and uh, my grandparents in a very small town called uh, Blaine Lake, Saskatchewan. And uh, from there uh, my father was transferred around the world with a machinery company. I uh, lived for a number of years in uh, South Africa. I actually did uh, up to matric at, in uh, South Africa. And then fortunately, only after six months uh, back in Canada, he was transferred to Australia, and that's the best thing that ever happened to me. Why a racing driver? What happened in your early life that made you go that way? Uh, well, I was very conscious of, of my father's, uh, shall I say, uh, unloading uh, boxcars to uh, corporate executive existence. and. Uh, once I started it myself uh, in Australia as a marketing cadet for uh, Volkswagen, uh, funnily enough, uh, I just couldn't see uh, waiting 20 years to be able to get in a position to do something. And it was a series of uh, small things that happened over a period of time, uh, going to a, a race at Sandown, seeing Sterling Moss race as a matter of fact. and. Uh, reading a bit, a uh, couple of records that I heard uh, with Jack Brabham, as a matter of fact, and all tended to encourage me and feel that uh, this was something uh, that was worthwhile doing. I was very uh, conscious of trying to do something with my life, and I didn't think sitting behind a desk was going to be uh, accomplish it. And I suppose a long story short, I just got a TR3 you know, on higher purchase and started to race it, and that was the beginning and the end. Once I got the bug, uh, I was away and uh, just became very acutely aware of my lack of uh, in-depth mechanical uh, training and the need to know what uh, the parts were all about if you had to spend so much money to buy them. And I gave myself a very little chance in my early days uh, driving a TR3. The results weren't too spectacular, but just good enough to keep me encouraged. But uh, ran out of money rather quickly and uh, honestly, uh, the car was so bad and uh, lack of any professional help or, or my ability to ask anyone to help me. Maybe a little bit too proud in that department as well. Um, I found myself sort of at the at a dead end about 1963. And uh, my father had been transferred back to Canada. The ticket was waiting for me because naturally everything was paid by the company. And I did go back to uh, Canada and spent a very miserable uh, 
about five months selling door to door because by that time I was uh, 21 and uh, my dad wasn't having me lunging around the house and certainly wasn't about to be giving me any uh, welfare uh, payments. Um, but it was a chance trip to Indianapolis in 1964 and just seeing the atmosphere there and the manner in which uh, things went on in such a professional manner that I said uh, for sure I would attempt to be not necessarily a racing driver but I would be in the racing business. I would attempt and give myself a couple of years to see uh, if I could make it uh, one way or another and I was quite happy uh, just being on the fringe. And, uh, worked a number of months uh, just as a gopher for Team Lotus and got a lot of experience that way and then a uh, chance opportunity to buy a real good car, an ex-Jimmy Clark car at a, at a rock bottom price. I had to shake my father down for that money and uh, he wouldn't give it to me. And I said, well, I've got some friends that'll give it to me and I always remember him saying, well, uh, we better keep it in the family and he gave me the money. What lies in the future? Uh, an early retirement, I hope. Uh, it's getting tremendously hard behind the wheel, and, and I, in that respect, I'm very surprised that uh, Sterling and Jack, uh, after the number of miles they had done, uh, that they'd want to come back to it. To me, I find it hard work. It's uh, mentally demanding, and it's uh, so uh, hard to uh, to uh, instill the confidence in everyone else that is uh, working uh, in the team. And, uh, to realize the, the significance of doing just some little thing uh, the wrong way. Uh, there's no prizes for second. And is driving here an ordeal? Yes, it is, uh, because uh, the, uh, we put so much into it, uh, and there's only one finishing position, and that's uh, winning. Uh, a lot of people come here, and they might finish third or fourth, and they think that's a tremendous achievement. And for the effort they put into it, that might be. But in our case, if we don't win, we lose. And when we lose, well, no one accepts failure. I don't, anyway. Leading the race. Few, uh, few troubles in the pits, by the way. We've had a retirement from the BMW. Ralph Radburn, who's sharing with Peter Williamson in the pits there, with uh, a rocker dropped in the motor. You can see Bob Holden's car there, the man who won with Rano Altman, one of the great rally drivers of the world in 1966, uh, in a fairly distressed state there, uh, Howard Marsden. Yes, uh, obviously overdone it. Uh, Bob was complaining uh, earlier that he had trouble carrying the extra weight of these vehicles. Uh, there's a little bit of controversy as to how much heavier the uh, new Escort is than the old Escort. Here's possibly a question that we can throw to Roger Clark. Indeed. Should, uh, we have Roger Clark, the great British rally driver, who drives the Ford Escort, an RS model, but not the 2000. Roger, you'll be driving in the total Southern Cross Rally that starts next Saturday in uh, an RS 1800. How does it differ from this car? Um, it differs mainly in the engine. We have the twin overhead cam with the 16 valves. Um, very, very nice engine. Um, 240 horsepower, something like 9,000 revs to play with. Um, it's music. Go to 9,000 safely. Quite happily, yes. It'll be a great race here in Australia as far as Fords and Escorts were concerned if you could run that sort of car here at Bathurst. How do you think uh, an RS 1800 in racing trim would uh, compete on this circuit? Well, uh, I haven't been around the circuit, but looking at it on the screen and uh, from what I've seen here from the pits, uh, it's very much a power circuit and you can't be acreage when you start talking climbing hills and that sort of thing. Um, this uh, long straight after the pits is obviously a power hill completely and uh, five litres or whatever you've got in the Falcon has uh, got to be a big advantage over two litres of Escort. 5.8 litres there, yes. We have in fact now the Marie Claude Beaumont car back on the pits. They changed the thermostat the engine. Me and Christine Gibson will be sharing the British Alfetta, which uh, has been running well all week. Just never was in good health from the start, which is a great shame. The best looking drivers in the race, undoubtedly, with uh, Murray Claude, the vivacious Parisian, who's a great rally enthusiast. In fact, we were speaking to her earlier and found out that rallying was what she liked. And while we're talking, by the way, we just noticed, dipping by and about to pass him, Alan Grice has got by both Bobby Morris and um, Colin Bond. That I saw him behind a while ago. He seems to have slipped up there. Yes. He'd now be in uh, third place. Yes, it's quite interesting, actually. Uh, the Alan Moffat lap times are now around about the 32, 2 minutes 32. Brock is catching back up to him. He's now down to about nine seconds behind. And this trio now are down about 27, 28 seconds. So they, these three are circulating more slowly than the Brock Moffat situation. We might just hover on um, Mary Claude Beaumont car. She was telling us that she began uh, motorsport because of an interest in rallying. She does drive in uh, a few rallies, and in fact, Roger Clark is looking forward to meeting you and Timo Mackinnon and Akim Bornbold and the other overseas stars who will be competing in the rally, which has attracted 
for Australia, the phenomenal number of 68 international drivers and co-drivers. That's a long way for a lot of people to come. Yes, I, I just hope it's uh, going to be as good a rally as it's made to be. It's the first time I, I've been here, and um, there are a lot of stories going around and a lot of rumours, but uh, I'm just looking forward to seeing the actual event. We had Paddy Hopkirk out here for earlier rallies. Paddy, of course, is now a given away rally, but, you know, he was instrumental in starting the beautiful Mari Claude Beaumont in rally, and she will tell us just how it happened. You became involved in racing through a meeting with Paddy Hopkirk. Oh, yes, it's a long time ago, a while uh, uh, Paddy Hopkirk was practicing the Monte Carlo Rally at the beginning with the BMC team. And uh, one day he just had a problem with his car at, uh, in Gap. You know, Gap is a little town in the French Alps. And uh, there was no any BMC dealer at this time. And he came to my father's garage and uh, uh, we helped him. And then other drivers started to come at our garage. And uh, I went to practice with them and that's why I started to be a rally driver. What we call navigators. And what happened then? What did you do then? Well, then I've been... That was about 1963, was it? The yes, year yes, Monte yes, Carlo, yes. And then he won the Monte Carlo Rally, and uh, um, I was still uh, always around uh, rally drivers and uh, uh, servicing also. And then in uh, 65, I had to wait one year more, and then in 65, one uh, the rally uh, champion, the girl who was champion in France, was looking for a co-driver. And she asked for me, and then we did for two years all the European men even together. And uh, that was a good thing because I learned a lot with her. What sort of racing cars do you drive? Well, then, I, then I've been rallying for many years, and then I start racing, and I first start with the big saloon cars, uh, you American one like uh, Camaro and Corvette, which is very very fast and very big. And um, I also drive um, a BMW 3 liter CSI. And uh, the best was last year when I was with uh, Leila Lombardi driving the World Championship for a sports car with an Alpine Renault 2 liter sports car, which was very fast. Do you find them difficult cars to drive? I have always been very lucky because I always had uh, good cars, you know. And, and uh, it's easy for me to change from one car to the other. It's not a big problem. Uh, when I was driving the Corvette, everybody thought that I couldn't drive a seven-liter car so big and so heavy. And I drove it at Le Mans for three years. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I won't be a good teacher. I cannot explain what I'm doing. But when I am in a car, I just do it as it's necessary. <laughs> It must be very physically demanding. Your neck muscles, for instance, must suffer wearing helmets in the very fast single-seater racing car. Oh, yes. That's uh, last year I had big problems because uh, the Alpine Renault two-liter sports car was very fast. It's nearly on a short track. It's only two seconds slower than a Formula One. And uh, I had big problem with my neck because the road, the road holding was so, so good that uh, entering so fast in the corners that my, I couldn't keep my head on my shoulder. So I, I had to, to do a lot of exercise for my neck and also to be in a very good uh, sh shape and uh, to, to be uh, very well, you know, because you, you get tight very quickly in this kind of car. Ari Claude Beaumont, Sir Glenn now in the Brian Foley Alfetta GT that was stopped in the pits to have a thermostat change. Going around neatly, regularly and pretty quickly at the moment, but a long way back in the class. Might be an idea, I think, to call up the IBM computer and have a run through and see what, uh, what outright positions are pertaining at the moment. We'll have the computer flash through its, uh, its message before long as we follow cars down Conrad Street. We'll still have Roger Clark with us. Nice of all running driving through as good looking as Barry Court Burnham, Roger. Certainly would. Uh, approaching the pit now, we've had uh, the uh, Bruce Hondoff car in there for a change of a rear tyre, and uh, he's gone out again. Uh, also adjusted the rear brakes. We have Kerry Luckett in the pits with Jack Brabham, who will tell us all about it. Over to you, Kerry. Well, uh, Jack Brabham, unfortunately, you've had a most spectacular re-entry to motor racing here at uh, Mount Panorama. What actually happened on the line? Well, actually, uh, we put a new gearbox in it last night, and... Uh, there must be something wrong with the leakage because when I put it in gear, 
getting ready for the start. I got two gears at once. Of course, once I'd got two gears at once, I couldn't do anything until everybody had gone. Because you've got to fix it from underneath, not from inside the car. And unfortunately, somebody ran into the back of me and uh, put me out. So we couldn't do anything about it then. Now, we've heard a whisper that you're going to try and get the car mobile, so at least you can uh, keep faith with the thousands of people throughout Australia who I know are really eager to see you uh, in a return to motor racing. Yeah. Well, we're working on the car, of course. But I think it'll take about an hour or so to uh, get it somewhere near it. Jack, will uh, this sort of thing uh, deter you from any further participation in uh, motorsport? Well, I didn't have any intention, so it uh, doesn't really make any difference now. Well, you've been uh, talking about one small possibility we can see you out on the circuit in uh, days to come. Uh, anything could happen, I don't know. All right, thanks, Jack, and we hope okay. we can see both you and Sterling out uh, very shortly to see some of that old magic uh, around here at Mount Panorama. Okay, thank you very much. Well, the old magic uh, we may see, but the old smile is still there. He doesn't need to be taken too badly, Roger Clark. Maybe it's the fact that he's been in for a long time, even though he's had six years out, and he's used to the good and the bad. I guess we hope, Nick. But you're not quite up to 50 years of age. It's been said, though, that rally drivers get better when they mature, and that the best rally drivers aren't necessarily the youngest ones. Now, you're about halfway. You and Tim are around the same age, still pretty young fellas. But uh, there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of good, very young drivers. We've got one or two coming up in the rally, including people like this Purr in Walfordson, who I believe, by having seen him, is a very fast driver. Yes, he's doing quite well, and uh, there are a lot of other young drivers doing well in Europe now. But uh, I do feel that rallying is um, more uh, a test of experience and uh, knowledge and using your head an awful lot more than racing driving, so uh, there's a hope for the old ones yet. Can I ask you what uh, Wolfritzen is driving? Uh, at the moment, Wolfritzen drives a Strata Salancia. Uh, and what's he driving out here? I have no idea. Oh, I tell you, that, that question was posed by Howard Martin, who is the team manager for Datsun in the Total South Cross Rally, and Wolfertson is driving a Datsun. <laughs> one of five works cars. There are seven that will come under his umbrella. Talking well, about umbrellas, that, that Union Jack there, which must stir your British heart, lies on top of a very British fellow entry, a man called Ron Hudson, who uh, I think is visiting England, but has probably no other connections. And that is the car that was very fast in practice yesterday, and in fact was the fastest in the two-litre class. Ron Dixon driving, a man who Roger Clark has driven mainly big cars. Well, he's um, a man, well, in his 20s, he's only been running for three years, made rather a late start in motorsport, but has put up some very quick time. He was fast at Sandown Park, a big circuit in Melbourne, in a 250-mile or 400-kilometre race a couple of weeks ago, and it was ran most rapid yesterday. A lot of people were predicting that the fast cars in the under two-litre class would be the Alfa Romeos, either the GTVs or the new GT AMs or the GT Coupes. Uh, and maybe the Escort RS2000 or the BMWs, but in fact, it was the two Dolomites. This one, driven by Ron Dixon, and the Enbrus car, in which uh, Graham Lawrence, New Zealand driver, who was a former Tasman champion at James Lang Beach in Sydney, were within four tenths of a second of each other, had really scooted away from the other cars. Right. Now, you've seen the Triumph Dolomites overseas. How would you have expected to have gone here? Well, it's true to form. Uh, in Europe, the Dolomite has do uh, dominated the two-litre class, mainly because of the engine. The Alfa Romeo engine is... Uh, quite old and outdated now and this 16 valve engine is like the uh, the Ford engine it's a very very good competition unit 16 valve four valves a cylinder and, uh, it really does pay off on circuit at 26 laps the order was Alan Moffat leading from Peter Brock in the Tirana then Alan Grice who moved up into third place Colin Bond was fourth Bob Morris just behind him in fifth place that's the IBM results as of 26 laps Watching the great race, the Hardy Ferrero Montana. Are you calling me, Evan? I know, we've, we've been asking for them, we haven't got them. They had a mistake initially and they had the wrong results. I called one up a while ago and we haven't got it. We'll try and get it on screen. Can we have the IBM results on screen soon? Thanks, Roger. Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, see you back. There's a bit of paper on the floor with the, what we have to say. Over there. Right down the floor.
Well, we've got an interview with Ron Dixon, but I don't really want to do that. Class, yeah. Down. Yeah, uh, you know, that's why I haven't wanted to put it up because I don't believe it. It's the same as in the little class, they've got Billy Evans down in third place, and again, I don't believe that. He's in third place, and he's just going away. Mount Panorama, and we're following Ron Dixon in the Mount Dolomite, which was fastest in practice, and following him as the man who was the fastest in his class, following him as the man who was fastest overall, and is leading the race, Alan Moffat, just about to slip by. Dixon will pull over to the left, and Moffat up on the fast line to the right. Noticing here that Murray Carter in the uh, third of the Falcons has already been lapped. Uh, just ahead of um, Alan Moffat is John Goss, who again will be lapped within the next two or three Get out for Carter, of course, in the pits to re uh, fix her bonnet lock, which was loose. The Dolomite coming through now. The IBM results for the, the class are a bit of a surprise. Um, they show that the, the leader in the class is the um, not the car we're watching, although we would have expected to be the leader. It's going quickly enough, but it's shown as being a lap down on the leader, which makes me a little surprised. We'll check that with the timekeepers. The IBM people will check through and just see whether or not that is accurate. But the results being fed to them and therefore put through the computer show that the leader is not 37, the one who was fastest yesterday, and seems to be doing everything right at the moment, but car 51, the Escort RS2000 of Ford and Timmons. I would expect that car to be quite quick, that Escort uh, RS, the, from South Australia. They've chosen to stay with the old model car again, as mentioning before, the uh, extra weight of the new model Escorts. This car possibly gives the most power um, the RS2000 of Ford and Timmons, but uh, again, I agree with you, Evan. I'm a little bit surprised to find that uh, IBM are pushing it up as the leader of the class. Right, I'm surprised to find this car allegedly a lap back, but let me run through just the, the points as we have them. Uh, Eric Board and uh, Tom Timmons from South Australia are shown as the leaders and obviously doing well. That was when they had covered 23 laps, which was three less than, than Moffat, who was leading the race. Then we have the Alfa Romeo number 39 of uh, Phil McDonnell and Jim Hunter, which is not unexpected because they've been going well and we're expected to feature well. In third place, car 45, the Escort RS2000 of Linda Narnell and Peter Hopwood, the sports car driver. Then we have uh, the Alfa Romeo number 40 of Peter Werrett and David Jones, the car, the left-hand drive car, in fact, that Marie Claude Beaumont and John Leffler drove to a class victory last year. Behind them is John Leffler and the Formula Ford driver, Richard Carter, in the uh, Auto Delta into Alfa Romeo. Bruce Hodson from Griffith in the De Bertoli's Wine car with David Morrow is next in sixth place, car 48 is the number. Car 41 and seventh, Ron Gillard and uh, Harrison. Then we have the um, Victorian Alfetta from um, Clemens Sporting Car Services where they sell all sorts of cars, the most exotic place to wander through amongst Alfa Romeos and uh, Ferraris and some beautiful machinery. At the moment they're in eighth place in car 60. That's uh, with Tony Roberts co-driving the winner of Bathurst back in 69 when Colin Bond scored his first and only victory. The RX3, the small one of Bruce Williams and Cook. And then just running through very quickly, in 10th place, the Escort of Daly and Jones, number 50. 53, the VW Golf of Hire and Lander. Then they show um, the Dolomite we were watching earlier, 37, Dixon and Lawrence. 38, the, Do the Dolomite of Lang, Peach and Gelson, another car we would expect to be up in, in relation to its practicing time. The BMW of Granger and Murphy, both BMWs have been stopped with rocket trouble. One has kept going, one has retired. The Granger Murphy car is still going. They're both out now, Evan. Both out. Oh, what a disaster for the two BMWs. Um, we have um, Bob Holden in 43, the car that was in the pit, steaming its head. We're watching the car, the South Australian shown as leading the class. So this is Eric Board from South Australia, and as we watch, we'll run through the results to a right down in what is the biggest and most competitive class. In 16th place, the Fiat 124 of Nuttall and Bailey. They're two laps down. In the 17th place, Murray Claude Beaumont and Christine Gibson, after a couple of laps in the, in the pits, changing a thermostat, 
They are, in fact, uh, eight laps down in their off header number 58. And then we have the cars that have had strife and have stopped her out. We have the uh, Rayburn BMW, which is out of the race number 57. 49, the Escort RS of Jim Murcott. Uh, bad luck that they're so far back because they went through frantic efforts to rebuild the car after almost total disaster at um, Sandown. They've had gearbox trouble in this race, which is bad luck because they've hardly gone to bed for three weeks to get the car ready. Jim Murcott was telling me this, so he and Bob Stevens sharing the car. And um, then uh, we have, of course, with no laps, car 35, the Delaca Dolomite that features, features in that starting line disaster with uh, Jack Bradman, put Bradman back into the pits for a couple of hours and 